Hi, there's so many of you. As a presenter, I must say it's frightening, awesome, and truly exciting. So I googled motivational quotes before presenting. You can speak well if your tongue can de deliver the message of your heart. So yeah, as I said, my name is Ketmar. I am a pipe drive developer. But today, I'm standing here, I'd say even more, as a greater, as a developer, obviously, as someone who loves to build and bring his ideas to life. So, oh, the clicker. As we heard from two previous presentations, building your own component library is a great idea. It gives you development speed, it gives you consistency, both visual and code-wise. But what if you're not as big as Pipedrive or Big Bank? What if you're a solo developer like me, working on his personal projects? or just about to launch your new startup, you don't even know what your product is supposed to be. So, what if your priorities lie elsewhere? I'm gonna show you a small demo of a project that I've been working on, and it's not gonna be a live demo because, well, I'm not stupid. It's a really simple website that gathers together different places where you can carry out your events in Estonia. So there's this search flow where you can filter out which places do you want to see. It has some UX components like filters and loaders and cards for each place. Awesome in image gallery. And whoa, you can actually click on the card fill out some forms, date pickers, wah, huskies, totally part of the presentation. Yeah, cool projects. Um, the clicker is not working. Next slide, please, Fred. I'm telling you, live demos. <laughs> uh, yeah, a light bulb. I, I like working on this project, but it's definitely not my first priority in life. I also like to do other things, for example, work in pipe drive. But what motivates me to work on this project is that it brings actual value, that it tries to solve an actual problem where people need to find a place to carry out their event. My mom said it's useful, so that's something. In order to make sure that not, it's not only my mom, but also other people, I have to get feedback about this product. Get feedback from real users as soon as possible. I've been freelancing for some time, and what I've learned is that things that I think are awesome sometimes are not that awesome. And at this point, I'd like to ask, please raise your hands, how many of you know what a MVP means, or most viable product? Uh, more hands, maybe? <laughs> okay, good. I can still tell you what it means, from my point of view. So, imagine you have a problem and you want to solve it. Let's say the problem is moving around. As a problem solver, as an inventor, you're thinking about building a car, but you're poor, or you don't have resources. You can't build a car. So what an MVP is, as it, as it can be seen in this context, MVP is a skateboard. It's a product that solves the problem, 
but you built it with least effort. So in that case, the skateboard can be used to move around, but probably when you have a vision of building a car, that's not the best solution. But you can still hand it out and ask feedback. So shortly put, MVP is a product that brings value, but it's built with least effort, and you can actually ask feedback for it. Now, how to get from the skateboard to your big round vision, the car? <laughs> There's this book called Lean Startup, which introduced me to an idea of validated learning. Basically, it's a loop or a cycle of building, measuring, and learning. Or in software de development, it's coding, gathering data, using this data to, to come up with new ideas and go back to coding and building. So if we go back here, you build the skateboards, you go through the cycle of building, measuring, learning, get to the next iteration, and so on and so on. But the thing is, as a huge creator as I am, and also a developer, I can say that the biggest bottleneck here in this cycle is coding, or the building part. It slows down the whole cycle, and in order to get from the skateboard to the car, the cycle must be as fast as possible. In my case, by the way, this page is called Coralda.ee, so some advertising. This is the initial design for the uh, landing page that I created. It's a custom design. I built it as an MVP. It was awesome, I'm telling you. I was like, I'm going to launch it. Everybody is going to like it. They didn't. So my friends were like, hey, I don't know this solution, this search bug. You have to click too many times, blah, blah, blah. I was like, man, it's working. And they were like, yeah, but it's not convenient. So I was like, yeah, but I don't have time to build everything around. But as I said in the beginning, if I want to bring real value, I have to rebuild it. So yeah, now we're, we get to the solution. There's no silver bullet, if there was, and I knew the answer, to all this development speed and quality and everything. If there was a one answer and I knew that, I'd be probably rich. But I can tell you that if you're looking for development speed, good design, consistent design, and good UX in a quick manner, then a real viable solution would be well, this is a front of meetup of component libraries, so. Component libraries, yay! <laughs> but not just component libraries, pre-built component libraries. Libraries that have built by other people for you, so you don't have to build everything yourself. Ta-da! <laughs> I see component libraries, both pre-built and built by your own, as Lego blocks. You have those small structures that have predefined visual, the colors. They have this predefined pattern how they match together. But in the end, if you like put all of them together, you can just go crazy and build whatever you want to. Build something that actually brings in some value. In my project, I found this cool, awesome labor <laughs> library called Element. And here's just a couple of examples of different components it provides. For example, this card component, which I made use of. OK, not in that slide, definitely. <laughs> but the buttons <laughs> and the model, <laughs> they're still from this Element component library. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that you can use those pre-built component libraries to create something your own. But this can be applied only if you're willing to make some sacrifices. 
because sometimes design isn't the thing that you, sp you should be worried about. User experience, definitely. But design, I haven't heard anyone bail a product because the button was light green instead of green. But they will bail your product if the button won't work. So using pre-built component libraries is a good way to build a product where you are not willing to invest all the time. So by using those pre-built component libraries, you invest the 20% of time and effort and get the 80% of functionality. So I strongly recommend you to think about using pre-built component libraries if you do not have strong visual guidelines to follow, if you are wi willing to use some predefined design system, if you want to have a consistency, both visually and code-wise, and if you want to keep up the development speed. So, no money? Okay. Anyways, cool. Now you know what pre-built component libraries are. How to find one? Exciting question. Google it. <laughs> Yeah, the, the Google's quite awesome, actually. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that finding a component library is quite easy. You just Google for your front-end framework component UI libraries, and you will get different sources that will probably provide you what you need. I'd, write, I'd like to bring out uh, one specific source. It's this GitHub repository called Awesome UI Component Library, and it's truly awesome because it provides a list of different available design systems and component libraries for you for the most uh, popular front-end frameworks. So here's an example of React.js. And here's a short list of different pre-built component libraries. Not that short, actually. So finding one isn't that hard. The actual question we should be asking is how to choose one. Again, I could tell you just Google how to choose a component library, but that would be too easy. <laughs> there are like hundreds of articles for that. So I went to some companies that actually use pre-built component libraries in their production. First one, is Katana. For those who don't know, Katana is this awesome Estonian startup and also product that small manufacturers can use to plan their material requirements. And here's a small picture of their product and UI. As you can see, there's a lot going on. The other one is OutFunnel. It's this marketing automation tool that you can integrate with different services, for example with Pipedrive, that should make salespeople life much, much easier. And they also have their own visual styles, but they also make use of pre-built component libraries. So the question is, how did they choose the component libraries that they are using? And based on the insights, I created a six step or uh, six key points you should think about when choosing one. The first one, know your requirements. When you start building something, you definitely have an idea, the problem you're trying to solve. And probably you know how you want to solve it. If it's the right way to go, we don't know. But you should have an idea what you're going to build and what is the, at least initial user interface and user experience of it. So you can choose the different components you want to use there. For example, I knew in my project that I need a contact form that includes a data picker. So that was one of my strong requirements. Also, you probably know the front-end framework you're going to be using, whether it's React, Vue, uh, Angular, whatever. 
And if you have some specific design system, maybe there's already a component library for that, so you don't have to build your own. Second one, when you find a component library, check the components, check the design of it. Are they extendable? Are they customizable? Maybe you don't need to customize and extend them. Maybe you do. You don't know because you're building a new product. And usually, when you think you know what's ahead, most likely you don't. So it's good to check how many components there are, how they differ, and so on. So if you're going to have a problem, then you have a component library that has a component for that. Thirdly, as we saw from previous presentations, documentation is with vital importance. A clear structure in the document. Does it have a sandbox to play around with the components? Does it have examples of different variations of components? I can't make it like too understandable, but documentation is with vital importance because it's the first source you have to go to when you have problems. Oh, check that out. That's the fourth point. Let's call them vitality signs. These are statistics like number of GitHub stars or weekly NPM installs or maybe stack overflow issues. Basically, what I'm trying to say here is check the stats that, pro uh, that ensure you that this library is being used, it's being developed, and there are actually other people making use of this library. Because if you have a problem and there's nothing in the documentation, then at least there is a community that can help you. Fifth, are there any other companies implementing the same library? I mean, I'm building my own product, I don't care. But if you are a startup that's about to serve real customers, it'd be nice and ensuring to know that there are already other products, other people having acquainted with this component library. So there's this website called stackshare.io where you can check out different tech stacks of companies and products. Worth noting. And sixth, <laughs> just npm, uh, npm install and play around. Because in the end, it's going to be you and it's going to be your team who's going to use this component library. It has to feel right. In the case of Katana, they make use of React.js as their primary front-end framework. And they chose to go with Material UI which is a component library that uses Google Material Design as the basis. And among other stats, I would just bring out that it has one million plus weekly downloads in NPM, so you can be quite sure there are people using it. In the case of OutFunnel, they make use of Vue.js and Vuetify, which is also a really popular framework for Vue.js uh, component library. Again, some stats that should give you some confidence that you are definitely not alone when dealing with problems. And now, my product, Coral.de, also built in Vue.js. And I found this awesome library, component library called Element. And I liked its documentation. I liked that it had real examples and different variations in the documentation. So I checked it out. I liked the visuals. And I saw that it's actively, actively being developed. So I chose this one. And now, Fred, if you can give me my screen. By using this awesome component library called Element, I took some time today to build a resources page for all of you people. And it took me around 
10 minutes and you have so much interaction going on. Like you can go through the steps of everything. It even has a bar with percentages. How awesome is that? All the PMs would be like, whoa! So, and you can also uncheck it. What? You can start the whole process again from a new component library and some other resources. Back to slides, please. The point here is that it took me about 10 to 15 minutes to build something like that. If you are a new startup, you don't know what you are going to build. You're going to change and validate your ideas all the time. You need something you can use to validate your ideas. And component library is a great way to do that. Because those design systems, if you choose wisely, have been tested out. They will give you the consistency, both code and visual wise. And most importantly, you get things done in a quick manner. The clicker. So yeah, as this guy here said, be smart, use component libraries, and I thank you for listening. I'm glad to answer to all your questions. Awkward. Why? Yeah. So six years ago, we started building this website to find places where you can carry out your events. We built one, no one liked it, no one used it, but we got our, some paying customers. We were like, ah, oh, he pays us only like 10 years, we don't want to continue with it, so we stopped. For the next three or four years, we were like, oh, we should, should have continued with the website. Next, uh, or last year, we decided, OK, we should build it again. So that's why. We have a target customer audience. Whenever you want to organize an event, then that's the place to go. And we have, we are close to getting our first paying customers also. But it's meant for people who want to organize an event so they can go to this site and find the place where to do that. Hello. Uh, Hello. I hope you were finished with your question. Uh, so, my name is Lauri and I last seriously developed front-end like five years ago. So, was there a time when people forgot about stuff like jQuery UI or... Like, this seems eerily sim similar. How is this news? <laughs> it's definitely not new. But there's a difference, firstly, a bigger difference is that you can just use jQuery and jQuery UI. There are some existing components and so on. But the point about of component libraries is that there's actually a design system beneath. So there's some kind of logic in the UX, in the design, and also, well, in the components itself on front and side. To me, it's the main difference. But well, why I gave this speech and why I wanted people to know about it. I'm more than sure that most of you know about component libraries or have used, I don't know, Bootstrap or whatever. But sometimes it's still tempting to build things your own. So that's where I want to emphasize. If you don't have this strong visual uh, necessity, then don't build things your own. Start using component libraries. Thank you. It was a great talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you for the really, really great uh, overview of Components Library. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, 
if you're a bit bigger company, let's say like Microsoft, that is US as well, uh, how would you handle accessibility problems? Like, uh, what I mean by accessibility is that when you hover a button or use screen readers or something like that, and uh, you encounter the problem that a oh, button is not telling you the content of it or the card is not reading the content of it. How can you, how would you fix this kind of issues uh, with a component library if it's not your source code? And uh, do you have any experience regarding ac accessibility? Okay, that's a <laughs> really good question. So firstly, experience, no, but Two things that popped to my mind. Firstly, the point one that I brought out in the six uh, checkpoints, know your requirements. So when you're making a research for your component library, this could be one of your requirements. The other way, maybe, would be wrapping components with your own some kind of functionality, just an idea. It may work. And the uh, second question, actually, is about, mm, let's say, bund if you bundle things together, like you use Webpack, uh, for example, uh, have you checked when you import one button what comes with your, uh, what comes into your bundle? Let's say, tree shake, let's leave tree shaking and this kind of stuff uh, behind for now. Uh, have you checked what, what what's inside it, or do you have any, like, rough estimation uh, when you use random library, what comes with a button, for example? I can say that with this specific project, no. But I know, for example, in Bootstrap, you can take the specific components or uh, the CSSS files that you want. So I believe in bigger compo uh, component libraries, you can choose what you actually want. and. Again, if it's too big of a problem, then maybe component libraries aren't for you if they do not provide this support. So it's all about decisions. Thank you. Hi, thanks for the talk, uh, but I'll actually answer um, a previous uh, question, the first one. Uh, what to do if uh, there is something wrong with the UI library you are using, right? Um, so I am a semantic, U a semantic UI JS um, contributor for Vue.js, and so I was playing with it, and there weren't tabs in there. So what I did is I actually created the pull request with the tabs. And now we have tabs in semantic UI <laughs> for Vue.js. That's how you deal with it. Uh, or you can create a fork if you're a company uh, with the, your own implementation. But uh, I'd suggest to always return uh, to open source if you made something if you think it's great in particular. And thanks for the talk.